Suzanne for leading us in worship and your mic. As always, taking care of all the details. Praise the Lord. By the way, before I go any further, I'll just mention that Mike does have some of his uh, keyboards and a couple of mouses. The kind you point, not the kind you trap. <laughs> but they're back there on the shelf above the uh, coat rack. So if anybody has a use for a uh, keyboard for your computer or for whatever you might have need of, a uh, new mouse or something, well, they're back there. Mike has generously given them to anybody who can use them, and so we appreciate that as well. Lord. And as always, Tim, thank you so much. I can't, I mean, I say it every week, but it's just, it just blows my mind. It's like you read my mail, brother. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just like a, I get a message and I'm thinking about that, and then Tim gets up here and speaks right to the point, and uh, that's the Holy Ghost. We appreciate that so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. And all of you for being here. God bless you, and uh, hopefully we'll have some dry weather now that we've gotten the rain, which we desperately needed, but... Uh, yeah. It's, it's good to have that past us now. And it's a little chilly in here, isn't it? Yes. I forget it. <laughs> it's set on 75, but it's air, so it's not going to warm up to 75, I guess. Yeah, we'd have to talk to Don about that. He would know the answer to it. But anyhow, uh, praise the Lord. Just snuggle up a little closer to the person with you, and, uh, unless you're Dan. And Come on, John. John. Get over <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Awkward. Uh, Praise the Lord. But anyway, I just didn't want to say any more about it. Anyway, God bless you all. Appreciate you being here and uh, excited about what God's doing. Amen. And things are starting to look better. I noticed coming into the church, they, they cleaned up a lot of the debris and tree limbs and branches and all that stuff. So the city's on top of that. And that's a good thing. Cleaning things up a little bit. So, Did you uh, hear about the inept psychic who tried clairvoyance, but he just couldn't get into it? <laughs> what do you call a fish with no eyes? Fish. Fish. Can you pronounce it? Fish. I get distracted by all the variety of meats in the deli section. I noticed back here in the in the uh, box too. It must be my tort, uh, short attention spam. <laughs> Sizzle, pork, and mmm. See the commercials? Hey, a lot of us grew up on spam, I'm telling you. We know a little bit about spam. It's not a bad thing, praise the Lord. Lots of different ways to eat it, that's for sure. Praise God. Okay, so let me just wrap up with this. What does a no nosy pepper do? A nosy pepper. Well, it gets all up in no face. <laughs> Jalapeno face. Jalapeno face. <laughs> Sound like me talking to Jer or to uh, Eric the other day, and we were talking. And I was trying to say something, and I, I mean I could not form the words. It was like my mouth was separated from my brain somehow, which is not unusual, but in this case it was just one word, and I could not make that word come out until I finally just had to give him the definition of the word because I couldn't say it anymore. Oh, well, that happens, praise the Lord. You'd say, well, you see now, no, I've, I've had this issue all my life. This isn't just something that came up in the last 10 years, so it's, yeah. you know, it's not about age. It's just stupid is, stupid does, praise the Lord. So anyway, I just want to talk to you about some things this morning, and you know, we're talking about the church and how church is different. It's so strange and unusual, you know, at this particular time. And, and the truth is, it's really not any different at all. It's just the buildings are different. The church is the same. The church is the people. The church is not the, the building, the edifice, or any of that. The church are the individuals. That hasn't changed. The church is still the church. It's just that the way we gather together, the way we're able to communicate the church has changed a little bit. But other than that, the church is identical to what it's always been. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. There's a lot of things going on that, uh, and I mean, let me just say, say this, and I'm not judging, I'm not questioning who is and who isn't. I don't have a clue. All I know is that everything that calls itself the church is not necessarily the church. Yes. I mean, there are a lot of churches and organizations that don't necessarily represent Jesus at all. They just represent their religion, their whatever it is they're trying to promote. So that's kind of what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart this morning. So let's begin with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Suzanne. 
We're living in a really unique time. And that's a little weird and scary, but I'll, it's also, it's kind of like the, uh, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times. Mm -hmm. You know the novel? But it's, uh, it is like that. It, it is the weirdest of times, but yet at the same time, it's, it's exciting. Because we know that something's going on here. Something more than just a pandemic, something more than just chaos and confusion and anger and frustration. There is a God thing taking place in the midst of all of this as well, and that's what excites me. Yes. I'm not uh, ignorant of the, the issues that are going on around us, but I choose to focus on what God's going to do in the midst of all of yeah. this and how he's going to raise up a people, amen, that will do some things that haven't been done, yeah. amen, and that will, that, that will reveal God. That's what this is all about. So in, in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And Ephesians 4, 13 through 16. Ephesians 4, 13 through 16. And while we're bringing that up, I want to again uh, welcome everybody on Facebook and appreciate you being a part of the service today. We do really appreciate y'all being with us, and we realize that there's space and time between us, but uh, nothing of the Spirit. We're all one in the Spirit, and we appreciate you being here. And your presence is valuable. It's important that we all come together, even as Don was talking about. This is, this is what the church is really all about, Amen. coming together, being strengthened by one another so that we can go out and be a strength and a blessing to somebody else. Amen? Amen. So until we all come into the unity of the faith, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Praise the Lord. Now verse 13, if you can go back to that, Suzanne, in chapter 4 there. Till we all come in the unity of the faith unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in verse 13 here, it gives us four marks of the completed body, of what the church is to be, what it's supposed to be, amen? And that same verse is literally translated until we all come into the unity of faith and of the acknowledging of the Son of God unto a full grown man, unto the measure of the stature that represents Christ in his fullness. Now that's also telling us the church isn't static. The church didn't just get planted and then that's it. It's, it's done, right? The church is in a condition of growth. The church is in a condition of development. Amen? And the opening word of verse 13 here is till. Now, English, just by the way it's written, this word till is telling us we are, we're moving toward a predetermined end. Otherwise, you wouldn't say till. You'd be saying what if or however or whatever. No, he's saying till this, we reach this appointed place, this appointed time, this appointed condition, so to speak. Amen. And that's confirmed by the expression into or unto, it says, a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till we all come in or into the unity of the faith. Right? And the knowledge, right? So in, in what, this, what he's saying is the unity of the faith. Till we all come into the unity of faith is the place God's trying to get us to. All of who? All of his church. All of his body. Right now we've got believers probably in denominations of every sort, of every type, and uh, every name, however you want to define it. And within those same churches or organizations, there are people who are not saved. They go to church, but they're not, they don't have the personal relationship with Jesus like Tim was talking about. They've, they know some religious stuff like Paul did. 
but they haven't had an encounter with Jesus. They haven't got a real born-again experience. All right? And I think that's true probably of every church organization that there is. So that's what he's talking to us about. Until we all come in, until this body all comes into an agreement. All right? And the way that leads into this unity, Paul says, is the acknowledging of the Son of God. Now, there's lots of churches out there that Jesus is just another thing to talk about occasionally. He's not the focus. He's just one thing that they, they deal with, right? And so every doctrine, every teaching of the Bible, in, the, in truth, if you look at the Scripture the way it's intended to be looked at, it reaches full expression. Every doctrine, every teaching, it, it reaches its full expression in the person and the work of Jesus. Amen. Not in, not in the, the, the thing but in the person, in the, in the man himself. And history, I mean, all you got to do is take a short glimpse at that. It tells us Christians don't achieve unity by fighting and discussing and arguing over doctrine. Amen. Amen. You, ever, you ever had a conversation like that? It just goes haywire in a hurry. It gets crosswise. Amen. And so you can't talk, you can't talk doctrine and, and argue and, and, and debate it in the abstract. And that's the reason that it doesn't work that way. If you think about it, that's what Paul was doing. He was arguing his belief abstractly. In other words, without God being the center of it, without Jesus being in the midst of it, he was just talking religion. These are the rules. You guys aren't following them, so you deserve to die. Amen? And so if we're willing to acknowledge Jesus in his fullness as the all and the be all, amen, and acknowledge him and give him the rightful, amen, position as all in all, amen, then the various doctrines of Christianity, weirdly enough, start to fit together. When he's the focus, then the doctrines are not an issue. It's only when the doctrines are the issues and he's secondary. And that's what we see in so many churches today. Amen. So the way to unity or the way into unity of the faith that he's talking about here is through the acknowledging of the Son of God, for His truth, for who He is, for what He is, for what He's done, for what He's doing, for what He will ever do. Amen? And that also leads us unto a full-grown man. That leads us into maturity as Christians, as believers. The church is growing up. The church is literally in the process of growing into a mature, full-grown man. To where Jesus grows up in the church, right? This man is grown up to be the full stature, and that man will be able to represent Christ in all of his fullness. He's going to be, in the truest sense, the embodiment of Christ. Who is? The church, when it grows up into the full stature. It's going to be Jesus. Amen? In all of his fullness. In other words, in everything that he's done, the church will be doing. He's going to be the truest embodiment of Christ. A perfect revelation of Jesus. Amen? And if, as that, we will be endowed with every grace, every gift, every ministry. In other words, the completed church will represent a complete Christ to the world. Because what the church is, up to this point, has been revealing to the world as Jesus is limited. One church doesn't believe in miracles. This church doesn't believe in, you know, a born-again experience or whatever it might be. We're, we're, we're giving bits and pieces, but it's not a clear picture. It's not a true and full picture of Jesus. And that's what the church has to become in order to have the impact that it's supposed to have. Look at Ephesians 527, uh, excuse me, 5.27, Suzanne. Ephesians 5.27. That he might present it to himself. He's talking about the glorious church. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now what's weird about this, when you look, you look that up, the literal translation, Paul describes this, this conspicuous uh, feature here of the church, glorious. Right? That, that word is a God word. It's, a, it's representative of the presence of God. The glory. Amen. So this glorious church, or 
It's going to be filled, in other words, with God's glory. The one he's talking about, this full-grown church, the church that's matured, amen, that has uh, come together in unity in Jesus, right? And that word glory, it denotes the personal presence of God, amen? The personal presence of God that's made manifest to human beings. Praise the Lord. Look, what I'm trying to say here is that you go to church and you may never get a manifestation of Jesus in most churches, or in many churches, I should say. You're just going to get a teaching. You're going to get a religious talk uh, to do certain things or to not to do certain things. But you don't have the encounter with Jesus. You don't have the experience. You don't see the manifestations, right? And that's, that's true everywhere, but I'm just saying that's, that's where we're at. So the, this glory denotes the very presence of God being revealed to people. That's the, that's the job of the church, if you want to know the truth. That's what we're here for. Yes. Everything we've been talking about, revealing to people, to our families, to our friends, to our loved ones, to strangers, to whoever we encounter, right? Now, here's the deal. Remember after Israel uh, was delivered uh, from Egypt? And this is what just blew my mind when Tim was talking about all these things, because it's almost word for word what I want to share with you. So after Israel was delivered from Egypt... That glory that we're talking about, it became a form of a cloud. Or it revealed itself in the form of a cloud. And that cloud, that glory, overshadowed the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it also filled and illuminated the Holy of Holies. Amen. Know you not, you are the tabernacle of God. You are the house of God. Amen. And so with that, that's a type. Amen. That's pointing to something that we're supposed to be seeing and understanding, which is Jesus. Amen. That holy of holies in the tabernacle was God's dwelling place or where God would abide at some point. Right. So let's look at this quickly in Exodus chapter 40, uh, verses 32 and through 35. Exodus 40, 32 to 35. When they went into the tent of the congregation, the tabernacle, and when they came near unto the altar... They washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court, round about the tabernacles and the altar, and set up the hanging of the court gate, so Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Or God's manifest presence filled it to where it was visible or known by the people that were there. And so... Moses was not able to enter the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Well, we have a great advantage today because the Holy of Holies has been opened so that we have access to this God. But we still live as though we're under that old covenant many times. Amen? So Paul describes this idea, this whole thing as the, the glorious or the manifest presence of God. So the completed church in this same way is going to be overshadowed and filled and illuminated by the manifest glory of God. Those things were not written just for the sake of having something to write, but it was written for our admonition, for us to know that there's something God's doing in reality today that he did symbolically 6,000 years ago or 5,000 or 4,000, whatever it might have been, right? Amen. Know you not, you are the temple of the living God. You are the tabernacle of God. And he's coming again to this church, not the building, but to the person that that tabernacle represented, amen, for what? To manifest his glory, to manifest his power, to manifest his supernatural ability, amen? And this is also the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer in John 17, uh, verse 22 and 23. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. What was the glory? He said, the Father's in me. I'm in the Father. Right? I don't do anything but what the Father does. I don't say anything but what the Father says. So I, that same glory which you gave me, I've given them. How, how do we know the glory? Because we saw the miracles. We saw the signs and the wonders. We saw the miraculous that only God can do. And we saw it through Jesus Christ. Amen? So that we may be one, even as we are one, so that the body can be one, just as Jesus and God is one. All right? I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, or mature, 
Amen. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them and thou hast loved me. Amen. That's the glory that completes the unity of the church. Amen. That's where we're headed for. That's where we have to get to. Amen. For God to do what God's wanting to do. Verse 21, if you can go back one verse there, Suzanne. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The united, glorified church is God's witness to the world. Not religion. It was never meant to be religion. It was meant to be a people who were united in faith in Jesus Christ. And that only. That's where God is bringing us to. That is the completed church, and that's the church that's going to defeat the enemy. That's going to bring a return of Jesus because of a manifestation here of his glory. A church that's without spot or without wrinkle. A church that's just like Jesus. A church that manifests God. Isaiah prophesied this end time church. Look at in Isaiah 59, 19 through uh, chapter 60, verse 5. Isaiah 59, 19 through Isaiah 60, verse 5. Uh, do you know the last verse of 59? Uh, no, but I can tell you quickly. Uh, 21. So shall they fear the name of the Lord and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. But the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, said the Lord. Praise the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of thy mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This is, remember, this is prophetic about the end time church he's talking about here. Okay, verse 2. For well, behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. How many of you know there's a lot of darkness out here in people's lives? Amen. Continue. Through uh, five. And the Gentiles, that word Gentiles here is not just speaking about non-Jews. He's speaking about unbelievers, people who are not born again, people who don't know the Lord. All right. And the Gentiles, or these unbelievers all around us, everywhere, will come to the light. And kings to the brightness of his rising, or his appearing, or revealing. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together. They come to see, thy son shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see, and flow together, and thy heart shall fear, and be enlarged. Because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee, the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Praise the Lord. Amen. That word forces there translates literally wealth. Remember the scripture, the wealth of the wicked will be laid up for the, right? So it's, it's, it literally translates wealth of the nations shall come to the church, to the believers. In the first part of verse 19, if you can go back to chapter 59, verse 19, Suzanne. I know I got you bouncing back and forth, although it's kind of hard to do that sometimes. They don't like going backwards, I know. So shall I fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Amen. So in the first part of verse uh, 19 here in, in chapter 59, Isaiah declares what the purpose of God is. Amen. What God is really planning, what God is really doing. Amen. There's going to be a worldwide demonstration of God's glory that's going to cause awe and wonder among all nations. Every nation. Praise the Lord. And the second half 
of that verse shows that Satan, the enemy, is coming like a flood. Amen? He's trying to oppose God's purpose. Amen? But his opposition is going to be overcome by the Holy Spirit. That spirit. Amen? Amen? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to lift up some stuff. Praise the Lord. Amen? And so historically, it's the, it's the darkest time. Amen? It's the, it's the worst of times for man when man has the greatest need yes. that brings the mightiest intervention of God. Amen. Every single time. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. So when we see this, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. When it looks like all oh, hell's breaking loose on earth, guaranteed, God is going to do something more powerful yes. than anybody has ever seen before. Oh. Amen? Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Praise the Lord. He'll lift up a standard. Amen. <clears throat> Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This is part of the message that's going to cause this to happen. Yeah. People have been told they've got to do, they've got to do, they've got to do. What God's saying in the last days, this truth is going to come together where Jesus is grace and mercy and love. And when that begins to be spoken to people, individuals, the glory of God is going to rise up, amen, and we're going to see some things that nobody has ever seen before. God's going to be identified as and to who he really is, amen, not just some, some uh, dreamed up experience or some dreamed up uh, ritual because of religion, but a real living God, amen, invested in his people. Praise the Lord. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto eternal life. By Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, we just read in, in Isaiah 59, 19, is presented, amen, as the standard bearer of God's army. Praise the Lord. And just at the moment when God's people are in danger of being totally scattered and defeated, the Holy Spirit lifts up a divine standard. Hallelujah. And what's the standard the Holy Spirit lifts up? John 16, verse 13 and 14. Glory to God. I'm, I, 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 this may just be bland to everybody else, but I'm feeling it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come, speaking of the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Amen. So what's this divine standard? Amen. The Holy Spirit has only one standard. Amen. Only one standard to lift up. Amen. It's not an institution. It's not a religion. It's not a denomination. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Wherever real believers see Christ truly uplifted, His Holy Spirit is going to gather there. It's going to draw people there. Amen. And God's going to be seen. God's going to be revealed. And the truth of His glory, amen, is going to be shown, amen, into the darkness. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Isaiah again, 59, verses 19 through 21. Isaiah 59, 19 through 21. Praise the Lord. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Don, you nailed it. Praise the Lord. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, or religious, eh, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, said the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Praise the Lord. So again, God's people have become his witness. Amen. With God's Spirit on them, His Word is being proclaimed through their mouth. What we've been talking about for years now, right? Without really knowing, thinking it's just another thing. No, it's, it's part of the purposes of God to bring this church to completion. It's not just another doctrine. It's not just another thing to do. It's part of God's plan to bring the fullness of God into this reality. Amen? To change people's lives. Amen? It's not a temporary visitation. It's a from henceforth and forever. Right. Praise the Lord. Look at Isaiah again now, 60 verses 1 and 2. 
And here's what Tim's been saying, and it's right on. I'm telling you. Arise and shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Amen? No more neutrality. No more fence straddling. It's who's for the Lord. You know? Praise the Lord. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And this isn't about being super religious at, by any means. It's about the Lord. It's about acknowledging that this is about Jesus and not about some denomination or some, some particular ritual or what have you. But it's about the church coming to a, a unity of the faith in Jesus himself. Yes. Amen. Not in a doctrine, not in a work, not in this, but in faith in Christ. Amen. Be ye not unequally yoked un together with unbelievers. Now, we've always thought, well, that means, you know, don't hang out in the bar with a bunch of drunks or something. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there's unbelievers in the churches. There's unbelievers in the rituals. There's, there's unbelievers in, in religion. And God's calling the people out that are believers, that are believers in Christ, not just people that are going to church for the sake of going to church, but people that are identifying with Jesus, that are understanding he's the whole purpose of all of this. Yeah. Amen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, but for what fellowship has righteousness, his righteousness, with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Praise God. The disciples asked Jesus a question, and this really fascinated me, so I, got, I, I was kind of looking through this, but I've, I've studied this before, but more in light with like the book of Revelation or something, but here's what I want to share with you this morning. Matthew chapter 4, excuse me, Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. So the disciples are asking Jesus a question. He's, he's doing all kinds of miracles and all sorts of things are happening. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying to tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So tell us when these things shall be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. Their question was specific. They didn't ask God for signs, plural. They asked him for a sign, the sign. Amen? The sign. The one final definite indication that the close of the age had come. Now, let's look at Matthew 24, uh, 5 through 13. And so Jesus responds, and he says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. And you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same will be saved. So Jesus gave them various signs and various events or trends that would characterize the closing of this period. But it wasn't until verse 14 that he actually answered their specific question. So look at 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. What was the gospel of the kingdom? Grace, signs, miracles, and wonders. Praise the Lord. When will the end come? Not by actions of secular government or military power or floods or satanic deception or lawlessness or plagues. The final decisive act is going to be the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus and the miraculous. Jesus and the supernatural. Grace and the power of God. 
I've got a book my daughter gave me, my youngest daughter gave me for a birthday or something one time, and it's events, 365 days, and it has historic events that have taken place. I mean, all the way back to the 13th century, I mean, hundreds of years ago, up to fairly contemporary times, you know, in the 80s, 90s, and so forth. The amazing thing that I've discovered, which I think, I, I, I'm sure I already knew it, I just, it isn't something we think about, but there have been wars and rumors of wars. There has been pestilence. There has been deceit. There has been the church turning against the think of the Reformation and the, and the numbers of people who were burnt at the stake, people that were killed, uh, Puritans who were killed. And you know, I mean, you know, just look at religion, see how it's fought amongst itself and murder and killing and chaos and so on and so forth. All these things. And you read it over and over. This is what Jesus is saying. He's just basically read my book. You know, he's just telling me what's in that book. So those things, he said, that, that, all that stuff's going to happen, but that's not the end time. That's not, those are not signs of the end. Those are just signs of times that are perilous in the earth. But when he reaches the specific question that they ask, which is, what shall be the sign of your coming? He gives it to them. He says, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He didn't say there'll be missionaries in every country. He didn't say there'll be Baptists, there'll be Methodists, there'll be Catholic, there'll be Protestant, there'll be Pentecostal, there'll be whatever. No, he says this gospel, this gospel you're seeing here today, this gospel of Jesus saying I'm one with God, and that's how I do these miracles, that's the sign. He said that's the sign to be looking for, because when that happens, you'll know the end has come. Glory to God. I'm I'm, we are on that verge. We are on the verge of that. Because we're seeing it in pockets. We're seeing it from time to time. What God is saying, that's going to be the norm for the church. For my church that has come together in the unity of the faith and grown up into the full stature of Jesus Christ and identified with that, not their organization, not their building, not their, you know, their, their denomination, not their rituals, but Jesus alone. We're, we are that generation. I'm telling you, that's what I'm excited about. I, I don't like the pandemic. I don't like the, the rioting. I don't like the, 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 the unfairness and, the, and the, you know, the, the way things are. That's humanity for crying out loud. And it's in the churches. Come on, let's face it. There were churches in the 1800s were saying God's for slavery. I mean, you couldn't have read the Bible and said that. And yet they had the Bible and they were preaching it everywhere. That's just one thing. But I'm saying it's just, those are the kind of things that are so distorted, amen, that religion has picked up on and operated in that we forgot what this was really all about. Yes. He didn't come to give us more religion. He didn't come to give us a different religion. He came to give us God, amen, in the flesh. Yes. And that flesh is now us. Yes. As believers. Praise the Lord. The final decisive act is going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the grace of God. Signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not, not occasionally, not once when the stars align, but always, wherever the need is, it will manifest. Yeah. Wherever there's a person who believes, miracles will take place. Praise the Lord. So by the Holy Spirit, the church of Jesus Christ is to, is to carry or take this gospel of the kingdom to all nations or to everybody. And through this final act, the church itself will be brought to completion. We will be what we were intended to be from day one. The end time purpose of God is the restoration and completion of the church. We think it's about all this here. This is just the place where it gets to happen. This is about God finishing his church so that he can take it to glory. Oh, praise the Lord. It's not, about, it's not about overcoming Russia, China. Hell, as long as there's people on this earth, we'll be fighting. Until the love of God rules. And when that rules here, we go there. 
And what's left is left to the God of this world. Amen? For a few years. And then we come back with Jesus and put a stop to all of it. Once and for all. New heaven, new earth. Right? A revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the completion of the church. A revelation of Jesus Christ to the entire world. Supernatural signs, wonders, grace, truth by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's where we're at, church. We're at that place. And I'm excited for one. I'm excited for it. I've had plenty of religion in my life. And it really did me no good. It wasn't until I come to an understanding of the love of God and the goodness of God that I've been set free. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that. I, I'll never be perfect here. But I can still be perfect in Jesus. As long as my focus is on him, I'll be the righteousness of God, and God can operate through us. And he's not a respecter of persons. He's just, he's getting serious. It's, I'm through playing religion. I'm through playing church. It's time for the body to grow up into who they, and what they truly are. And that's Jesus. That's, that's what I'm feeling. I'm, that's the... The stirring that's in me. It's not so much anxiety about this or that or the other thing. Read my book. If you don't, if, if, if you don't know, I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. Because all it does is depress you to see that how, itty, how ignorant man is in the natural. It's all about greed. It's all about getting my thing or power over somebody else. And it's, it's what we see in politics today. It's... Without God, this stuff is not going to get fixed. I'm telling I'm just telling you. Now, I have my preferences of who I want in office and who I, because they more closely identify with my values. But I'm not putting my confidence in them because I've seen too much of it. I've seen en enough elections to know they get into office, they're, either they don't do what they said they're going to do or they get stopped by the opposing party from doing it. Yes. And we end up in the same mess four years later or eight years later and we think, Foolishly, that somehow the next person who comes along is going to be the answer. Only to find out they're just another human like us. Sadly, some of them not as bright as us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. But nevertheless, that's why I'm saying the focus has to. He said, when, when, when all this stuff happens, look up, your redemption draws nigh. In other words, get the focus where the focus needs to be so that God can do what he wants to do. I'm excited. I'm excited about no longer having to, are you a Methodist? Are you a Baptist? Are you the, no, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. Amen. And he rules and reigns in my life. And he has come and filled his tabernacle to the point where Nathan can't do anything anymore. It has to be God that does it. I can't work my work. Amen. Only God can. And if I make the focus him, he'll tell me when to go and he'll tell me when to stop. And he'll tell me where to go. Absolutely. And his protection with provision will be on me. Yep. Praise the Lord. And that would be called Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. So I'm saying when we get in all the other reports, remember the report that really matters. Who's going for me? Tim, right? It's always, well, maybe the Methodists, maybe the Pentecostals will do it. No, I'll go. Let me, let me be a carrier of your glory. Hallelujah. That's what God's looking for. That's his end purpose. And that's where he's taking us. Amen. And he'll get somebody there, whoever will endure to the end. In Jesus' name. Again, give the Lord a hand. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. We got nothing to fear. God is for us. Who can be against us? Amen. Yes, John. Yeah, two weeks from yesterday is going to be a large gathering of believers in Washington, D.C. Many speakers, but they're all coming together to implore the Lord to uh, heal the land. And if my the people. Yeah, yeah. That's the theme. Yes. So uh, you might mention that so that people in cyberspace and everywhere else will know and we can mention again next Sunday to be praying and backing these people up who can't be there ourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Another example I might mention too,
there was a, a, a ministry that went to Chicago. And these were different organizations. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, like a group of Baptists went there, a group of Pentecostals. It was just believers gathered together to Chicago to pray and ask the Lord for healing and for wholeness. There was not one murder in Chicago that day. That is unheard of. Yeah. Chicago has one of the highest murder yeah. incidents yeah. of anywhere yeah. in the United States. And while that was taking place, there was not one murder. That's fine. That is the Lord. Yes. And God wants that to happen everywhere. Amen. He wants to stop the foolishness and the killing and the murder and the chaos that just rises up out of men's natural way of being. I mean, I've just, I, I told you, this, we say, well, it's, it's this or it's that. No, it's people. It's humanity that is unsaved. Read your history books. It's been going on forever. God says, it's, I had enough. My church, that's called by my name, is going to manifest my glory and slap that devil's face. Amen? Glory to God. Keep his image the focus. When the stuff comes flooding in, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. The Lord is ready to use you. Amen? And he's going to. And we have been privileged to live in this time, to experience what no man or woman has ever experienced before. We're going to see things that have never been seen. It, we're, we're going to see things that will put the book of Acts, it will make the book of Acts look natural. Yeah. Amen. Because it will be natural to us. It's only supernatural to the natural. To those of us who are supernatural, it's normal behavior. It's normal actions. God manifesting. Look, they can argue with us. They can argue with religion. But I guarantee you, they cannot argue with God. Right? Am I right? Is that what Tim was saying, too? When, when, you know, the guy with all the religious training, a genius, a theological genius, has an encounter with Jesus. There was no debate. Right? There wasn't any argument about, well, the, the law says this. No. He had an encounter with Jesus. He had nothing to say but... Who art thou? Once he found out who he was, he fell on his face before him. And that's what everyone will do. Yep. Amen. Every knee will bow. Amen. Every tongue will confess. Amen. And we get to be part of it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you again. Thank you all for being here. Amen. Live like you are somebody, because you certainly are. Praise God. <laughs>